when my son was in elementary school. He was in a multi-aged classroom, which uh, contained children young enough that they were calling adults by their children's first names, as in Mrs. Kevin's mom, <laughs> and also grand third graders who were almost grown up. And one day I took a group of them in my car on a field trip. The oldest, that worldly third grade boy, got in the passenger seat and the other kids were ranged in the back someplace. And I was being a very careful driver with other people's children. The boy turned on the radio and they were listening to something and I was successfully ignoring it. And all of a sudden he switched it off. And from the back seat up piped a little voice. So what is a virgin anyway? <laughs> And as I was frantically thinking about what I would say to this in a car full of other people's children, another little voice piped up from the back. I know, I know, little girl said. I know, a virgin is someone who is saving herself. Like I'm saving myself for Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> That's not it, says the boy sitting beside me. You don't know anything. Yes, I do, she says. Whereupon the original uh, questioner, as if the first answer had been totally understandable and he only wanted a second opinion, said, well then, what do you think a virgin is? He looked over at me. Do you know what a virgin is? He asked me. <laughs> yes, I said, I do. <laughs> well then you tell them, he says. <laughs> And I will never be a politician. In moments like this, the only thing I can ever think of is the truth. And so I said, a virgin is someone who hasn't had sex yet. See, says the boy in the front seat. <laughs> and the little girl in the back says, I knew that already. I know all about this sex stuff. Sure, he says, and turns in disgust to look out the side window. And she continues in her most grown-up, conversational voice. So, Mrs. Kevin's mom, she says, have you ever had sex yet? <laughs> I share this with, story with you because it is about the funniest thing that has ever happened to me. <laughs> Also because it was one of those moments in which I was so glad that because we come to this church, my son, also in that back seat, had had in his religious education class an introduction to the wonders of the human body and the making of good decisions about it. But mostly I share with this story with you because of all that it says about the feeling of knowing and how it can lead us astray. Unitarian Universalists are mostly people who at least at one time in our life cherished our doubts, cherished them enough to doubt what we were taught in Sunday schools or, and turn away from orthodoxy, or cherished them enough to doubt what others told us about orthodoxy and never joined up. We're sitting here in this church, in the branches, listening on the podcast, because at some point we took a faith road less traveled. We moved away from the certainties of the majorities, away from that comfortable feeling of knowing what we believed into the less comfortable area of uncertainty. And then in one way or another, we found ourselves here. This is a non-credal church. We don't offer certainty. We offer opportunity. We offer opportunity to deepen in faith and meaning in our lives. Because we know that people deepen and in faith and meaning in many different kinds of ways, we offer four kinds of paths and practices. We offer the path of learning, the path of inwardness, the path of community, and the path of service. Worship includes some learning. I'm going to ask you to put on your thinking caps in just a moment. Some inwardness, 
some focus on others, some opportunities for service. The trip to the border that our immigration learning team took a couple of weeks ago was mostly service, but service that involved learning, community building, and worship. Angela and I both value the balance of these basic goals in the church's programs. It's a balance that feels right to both of us. It's one of the reasons we're working together so well. So those of us who weathered uncertainty and change and got here have opportunities to deepen and perhaps come to new certainties, perhaps about big questions like God and life after death, but also about smaller questions, which are also important. I know I want to be doing for others is an important certainty. I believe in loving lightly on the planet. My spirit is fed by music. The animals on this planet should be treated humanely, and so on. What we feel and learn, what we find when we go inward, what we hear in conversations with others, all those experiences bring us knowledge, and with knowledge comes that delicious feeling of knowing. That little girl in my car all those years ago, I can still remember the eager joy with which she said, I know, I know, I know all about this sex stuff. What a great feeling, that feeling of knowing. <laughs> we notice this feeling often in contrast to the uncomfortable feeling of not knowing. So just remember the relief that comes when you turn a corner in a neighborhood you don't know well and realize you know where you are. When you're that nice feeling that you have when your computer is doing something odd and you remember, when in doubt, reboot. <laughs> when you can nod sagely in a conversation and think, I know that. It's a good feeling, knowing. We notice that feeling when we realize for the first time that we know something. When we realize that we know to the core that our spouse loves us that angels exist, that things, whatever is going wrong on the surface, that things will be okay. We just know it. And while what we know may be rational or non-rational, provable or intuitive, that feeling of notion, of knowing, the feeling that we have, is not rational. Not, as we are about to see, rational at all. It's not actually even a thought. It's a feeling, a feeling which apparently evolution has provided us to help us learn and persist in an ambiguous world. So I'm about to tell you some things that are going to dislodge that, some things that most of us just know, which is that we freely, rationally choose what we just know, and that being sure is the end line of a rational process of discovering what is true. So you can put on your thinking caps now and start to cradle your rotten tomatoes to throw at me and notice whether you are inclined to deal with a challenge to your feeling of knowing with denial, anger, or something else. Let me tell you about an experiment. You take a bunch of college students. You tell them that they are doing market research you give them a list of 30 popular CDs and ask them to choose their favorite 10 and to rank those 10 from 1 to 10. And then you thank them for their service and you offer to give them either their fifth favorite CD or their sixth favorite CD. Of course, most people don't really care very much about which one of those they get, but they have to choose to get one, so they choose. And then you distract them with some other task. Finally, you give them each a list back of their top ten choices in random order and ask them to rank them again. Now there's a very noticeable trend in what happens next. Most people will rank the CD they chose quite a bit higher the second time, and the CD they didn't choose will rank lower than it did the first time. That is to say, once we make a choice, we like it better and better and better. And once we choose against something, we find more and more reasons that we were right. Lots and lots of ways social scientists know this is true, and you know this is true too. That's because why before an election we talk a lot about how tedious it is to choose between Tweedledee and Tweedledum, 
But after the election, we are sure either that the best candidate won or lost. We had to make a choice in order to vote, and therefore we become more sure that we did it right. And that feels so good. It's the reason the first question a salesperson asks you is one they are sure you can answer in the affirmative. Because it feels so good to be right, and once we feel good, we make decisions faster and we spend more money. So whether our choice of candidate or our choice of CD or our choice of washing machine was rational or not in the beginning, that feeling of being right that we are left with is not rational at all. And it gets worse. Take those same students. Give them their fifth or sixth favorite CD. Then distract them with the task of doing market research on soap. Divide the group in half. One group gets two bars of soap and they are asked to evaluate the packaging and decide which bar of soap they think is better. The other half is given two bars of soap and asked to test them out by washing their hands. Take the results, throw them away, it's all distraction. Once again, ask your group of students to rate their favorite CDs. And here's what happens. The group that looked at the packaging of the soap does just what you expect when you understand that the human mind loves to be certain. They rate the CD they picked higher and the CD they didn't pick lower. Human nature. That good feeling of knowing trumps memory. Here's the surprise. The group that rated soap by washing their hands twice rates the CD list the same way they did the first time. In other words, they don't feel a strong inner need to justify their uncomfortable decision. They don't need the pleasure of knowing. It seems that washing their hands changed that need. Here's what cognitive scientists know. They know that washing our hands helps us to feel okay about tough decisions by giving us, apparently, a feeling of purity or righteousness without our needing to uh, rethink that decision. They know this by experiments like the one I have described to you, as you can imagine, something tan as tantalizing this has been tested many times in many different ways. They even know it by brain imaging. They can see what parts of our brains light up they can tell that there is something really profound about washing and thinking that we are right. But we know this from our experience. We know it from our literature. Think of Pontius Pilate. He condemned Jesus to death because the crowd wanted him to, even though he clearly didn't agree with that decision. And then he washed his hands. What he was doing, it seems, was helping himself regain that nice feeling of knowing he had been making a good decision by making himself physically clean. This is totally not rational. And what it means is that that nice feeling of knowing, like that little girl in my car who was so eager to share all she thought she knew about sex, that nice feeling of knowing is not right, it's not rational, it's not chosen. It is instead, quite clearly, a part of the reward system that's built into the architecture of our brains by evolution. When you feel you know something, you get a little squirt of feel-good hormones. Feeling doubtful and uncertain, that's uncomfortable. It's how we're wired. Probably because there's an evolutionary advantage to physically weak human animals finding a way to think more complex thoughts and plan over a longer term. And those whose brains rewarded them for that feeling of knowing did more of it, did it better, did it deeper. They survived, and they passed this little trait on. Now, you could say that evolution overdid this reward system, leading to self-confident idiots, people who sell all they own because they just know that the world is going to come to an end, Bores who won't change their minds and won't change the subject. Just to go back to that little scene in my car so many years ago, we see several dangers of being too sure we know what we know, too drawn into that happy feeling of knowing. There was the little girl who was so sure she knew it all but didn't even grasp the essentials. 
But there was also the older boy, whose disdain was probably age appropriate, but who I hope soon learned that you just can't treat people who are incorrect, especially when they don't have your advantages, with dripping scorn if you want to make friends and influence people. <laughs> we notice that youngest child had to brave considerable social consequences just to learn. Although nobody actually turned their know-it-all attitude on him in my hearing, he really did take quite a risk in that car. Ironic, isn't it, that the feeling of knowing, which probably evolved to help learning, also can hinder it. And then there's the one who knew and knew what she knew, at least on that occasion, and who was wise, and although flustered, <laughs> I can just feel those endorphins now. <laughs> I might feel them enough, actually, that I would not be open to further learning on this subject if I wasn't careful. I might be resistant to the idea that there was more to learn because I would have to first give up that fun feeling of knowing what I know. How can you be so sure? Philosophers have said forever that we can't be very sure about much, but nobody pays any attention to philosophers because we all have a mechanism of inner feeling sure which is quite compelling to us. We can be so sure because our brain chemistry works that way. We humans are wired for sureness. But those of us who are wise also must be clear that too much sureness can get us into big trouble by making us cocky, by making us rigid, by making us insufferable, which has the effect of cutting us off from our own wisdom and the wisdom of others. As the Hebrew poet Yehuda Amici wrote, from the place where we are right, Flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, like a plow. And a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. Turns out that the old saw about those who know and know that they know is incomplete. It turns out that the wisest ones not only know and know that they know, but they also know that the certainty they have about what they know is a matter of chemicals and not wisdom. They know there is always more to know. They know that others know differently. And they know that in spite of how sure they feel, they could be wrong. So flu season has started. As we've done in the past few years, we've put a hand sanitizer station out on the patio because we want people to feel that they can participate in a warm handshake with others during the service and shake hands with the ministers after the service without endangering their health. And now we see that this is a matter of much larger significance. <laughs> If our weekly reminder of all that we don't know, of the wisdom of strangers and the ambiguity of truth leaves you feeling a bit starved for that comfort, comfy feeling of knowing, you can just wash your hands. <laughs> and if that's too off the wall for you, we do something else in this church. We cherish our doubts. We hold up different perspectives. We show a variety of deep symbols of other people's faiths and truths. We remind ourselves that what we know and what we don't know are all together. We remind ourselves to honor our deepest intuitions while keeping an open mind to what we might learn and how things might change. We even sing a song about this. We are going Heaven knows where we are going, but we know within. And we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. We'll sing it in a moment. But first, would you pray with me? 
First, in thanksgiving for the wonderful, intricate ways we are human, for the ways nature works with us, for the capacity we have to understand our world and ourselves, for reason, for the patient workings of logic and science which teach us about our world. And secondly, also in thanksgiving, for the deep intuitions which guide us in ways that are not rational, but which give great meaning to our lives. Let us pray to always have the courage of the questioner, to wade through the discomfort of not knowing, to get new information, the courage to leave the pleasure of sure behind, when as a matter of fact, there is reason to doubt. We would be wise. May we be wise. Amen. And now let's stand and sing.